Twas the night before Christmas, and out of the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Hold it a minute. That was your first mistake. I'm staring like crazy to get these Christmas goodies finished. There is no rest for this hard-working mess. <laughs> the stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that Saint Nicholas soon would be there. Oops, that's mistake number two. The socks are by the fireplace to dry out. The kids in this house can seem to stay out of the wet snow. The children were nuzzled and stuck in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. Sugar plums, smuggle plums. These kids are dreaming about gifts. Gifts and stuff and things. They don't care if the stuff dances or not, they just like the loot. Miss Mouse, you certainly seem negative. Are you a little disturbed by Christmas? Christmas, bah, humbug. All it is is work and worry and loot and bills and gimme gimme got it. Oh no, Miss Mouse, Christmas is much, much more than that. Let me grab the first edition, The Night Before Christmas, and see if I can help you understand. Now settle down and listen. It was the night before Christ's birth, and up in the sky, the angels were coming to be heard on high. Tonight's the night. God is sending Jesus down to earth. I'm so excited. Who should we tell first? <laughs> we, um... Let me look at my assignment scroll. We are to go out. We are go to go to the house outside of Bethlehem and look for a group of shepherds. Shepherds, should we tell some important people first? Well, oh. <laughs> it's God's plan for you to tell the sh shepherds first. The birth is just the beginning of the plan. Well, God knows best. Let's sing. <laughs> small town were just getting ready to lay themselves down.
I have so much to do. I have never seen so many people in town. The tax census from the Romans is really causing a lot of headaches. My place is so full that I've had to turn people away. Just a little while ago, a young couple begged me to let them stay at my stable. I let them. The wife is expecting a baby any time now. <sighs> I suppose it's better than sleeping in the streets. Maybe I should go check on the couple. Nah, they'll be alright. <laughs> and out on the hillside while watching their sheep, a group of young shepherds were falling asleep. When suddenly out of the sky came a light, an angel appeared making everything bright. <clears throat> A vision. Did you hear what the angel said? Jesus is born. We must do what the angel told us to do. Let's go and look for the stable. The boy will take care of the sheep. Let's hurry. A baby is born this night of his birth. He's come to save all of the people on earth. In Bethlehem town, you'll find this dear child with Joseph and Mary, his mother, so mild. Sharing a manger with oxen and sheep, nestled in blankets, the babe sound asleep. Good news we bring you this wonderful night. Jesus is born! <laughs> Let us run to the site. Let's hurry. So after the angel delivered the news, the shepherds, the shepherds went searching with no time to lose. And such as the angels had told them out loud, they found just Jesus and Mary and Joseph so proud. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judah, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. 
and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Christmas isn't all need and giving him God to you. It's really Jesus and joy straight from love from God. That's right. Jesus was born on the first Christmas day, a gift from the Father. He planned it that way. And every dear person who hears and believes the moment that from Jesus a pardon receives and all of us have sinned and gone their own ways, but God listens closely when we choose to pray. And choose to love Jesus who came down to earth to, to live, to die, to give us a new birth. Terrific. Christmas isn't all deeds and giving him God to you. It's really Jesus and joy and love straight from God. Congratulations. Now you know the reason for the season. I will mention their names again just because it's worth mentioning and uh, they probably deserve a round of applause of their own. Uh, Sharon was up here playing guitar for them throughout and did a lot of the music. Uh, Ayana, you got to see on stage as one of the primary readers. And then Sherry was backstage corralling children, which might be the most difficult job of the three if we're being honest. But would you give the three of them a big round of applause? We are, we are certainly grateful for their generosity of their time and their giftedness. Uh, I'm just going to share a few short thoughts this morning. Nothing uh, elaborate, but I, I kind of want to just connect the dots a little bit for us this morning. 
Uh, there's a book that I read years and years and years ago by John Ortberg entitled The Life You've Always Wanted. And in the book, The Life You've Always Wanted, he goes through these spiritual disciplines. And when you think of a spiritual discipline, they are these things that help us better connect to God, better follow God. And so you think of things like prayer and fasting and meditation. But one of the very early chapters in that book is called The Art of Celebration. And he tells the story of his daughter. And he says his daughter has this thing she does that's called the D-Da-Day Dance. Okay? And essentially, at four or five years of age, anything that made her happy was a reason to have a D-Da-Day, a celebration day. And so she'd put her fingers in the air and turn in circles and go, it's a D-Da-Day! Probably much cuter when you're five. Um, <laughs> admittedly. But she'd, get up, she'd walk in the bathroom and the tub would have a bubble bath and it would be a D-Da-Day. She'd go to eat dinner and they'd be having mashed potatoes, her favorite, and it was reason for a D-Da-Day. Everything was a little moment of joy, a reason to celebrate. And we don't normally think of celebration as something we would have to practice, a discipline we would have to teach ourselves, like prayer and meditation and fasting. But the truth is, the older we get, the fewer Dida days we have. The more cynical we become. The more battle scars we carry. The more we walk around kind of a little grumpy and a little less celebratory. And so I was thinking this week, is there something that is so joy-giving, that is so full of hope and love and celebration, that even for grumpy old people like us, every day could be a Dida day? And the answer, I think, is found in Luke chapter 2. You heard Ayana read it earlier. I'm going to read just a snippet of it to you again this morning. Luke chapter 2. But the angel said to them, the shepherds, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, a Savior, who is Messiah the Lord, was born for you in the city of David. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in cloth and lying in a manger. I just, for sake of simplicity, want to focus on the first words that the angels speak to the shepherds. He says, I bring you good news. The Greek word there is the word euangelion, which means nothing to you, but if you saw it written, it looks just like the word evangelism. In fact, it's where we get the word from in the English language. And most of the time in your Bible, when the word euangelion appears, your Bible writers translate it as gospel. The angel says to the shepherds, I bring you the gospel. I bring you hope. I bring you the promise of what God is doing. I bring you good news. And while that word is loaded for us, for them it would have been even more powerful because it was a word that Caesar liked to use. When a new member of the royal family was born, he would send out messengers to the Roman Empire and say, I have good news. A child has been born. I have euangelion. When they would win a big battle against some enemy trying to invade, he would send out messengers announcing, I have good news, Rome won again. This is the euangelion of Rome. But the angels show up to the shepherds and say, we have a different gospel. We have a different good news for you. One that is unlike any you've ever heard before. It says we have good news of great joy. And joy is different from happiness. We, we get happy a lot, but happiness is fleeting, right? Last week, your quarterback played really well. This afternoon, it might be a different story, right? So the happiness from last Sunday may not be present at 4 p.m. We're in the same boat, my quarterback too, okay? So what made us happy last week may all of a sudden be fleeting this week. Last weekend, you caught 22 fish. This weekend, nothing was biting, and you come home a little less happy. Last week, your kids were really well behaved. This week, well, you get the idea. Um, (laughs) Happiness is fleeting. Circumstances change. Joy. Joy is this thing that happens inside of us that is beyond circumstances. That even on the worst of days allows us to have a D-da day allows us to celebrate and rejoice even when the circumstances aren't that good. Joy 
says, listen, you can make an exchange here. You can bring your sorrow. You can bring your hardship. You can bring your difficulties. You can bring your struggles. And you can exchange them for joy and rejoicing. And I love that the angel doesn't say, I have good news of some joy. He says, I have good news of great joy. And the Greek word there is megos, from which we get the English mega. I bring you mega joy. I have a joy that will trump whatever hardship you're going through. The literal translation of that word means to the largest possible measure. I bring you joy to the largest possible measure. The gospel that the angels proclaim, the good news that the angels proclaim, is joy to the largest possible measure. A joy that looks at whatever sorrow we bring, whether it be the sorrow of grief. Some of you are knee-deep in that right now. You're getting ready for your first Christmas without somebody you love, and you have the sense of sorrow and loneliness that goes with that. Whether it's the sorrow of shame and guilt, of knowing you are not who you're supposed to be, and you have all of these regrets on things that you used to do. Whether it's the sorrow of failure, of trying to do something, of trying to be someone and not being able to measure up. Whether it's the sorrow of loneliness and rejection that you kind of feel like nobody cares about you. You bring all of those sorrows and you stack them up next to the mega joy. The gospel of mega joy. And joy trumps your sorrow. In the midst of any circumstance, he says, I bring you good news of great joy. And then the most important part. Good news of great joy for all the people. It is very rare that good news is for all the people. At best, your good news is kind of indifferent to everybody else. You get a phone call this afternoon that says your, your child had, had a baby and you are a new grandma. That is great news for you. Good news of great joy for you. You know who doesn't care? Jose in Mexico City. Doesn't care that you had a grandchild. Just doesn't. Um, it, it's indifferent to him. When you find out that the, the cancer is gone, you get the phone call from the doctor and the cancer is gone, and you have good news of great joy. You know who doesn't care? Some guy living in China. He doesn't care that your cancer is gone. So at best, your good, most of your good news is good news for you and kind of indifferent to the rest of the world. Sometimes the good news for you is actually bad news for other people. When your team wins, that's bad news for the other side. When your guy wins the election, that's bad news for the other side. When you get the promotion at work, that means somebody else didn't. That's bad news for someone. And so sometimes our good news is only for us and our close friends and family. But good news of great joy for all the people. For the religious and the unreligious, for the rich and for the poor, for the good people and those far from God for those in the know and those on the outside, for those who are the people of Israel and those of us who are Gentiles who are far off, I bring you the gospel of great joy for all the people. That Christmas is good news of great joy for anyone who wants it. Regardless of color, creed, ethnicity, lifestyle, background, heritage, family tree, it is good news of great joy for all the people. And what exactly is this new gospel? What exactly is this message of mega joy? A Savior has been born. And he is Christ the Lord. A Savior has been born. And he is Christ the Lord. And the reason it's such joy is because if we look at that list of sorrows I mentioned real briefly earlier, and we bring the sorrow of grief, death, which seems so final and so permanent, and we hold it up next to the light of Christmas, that a Savior was born, one who would face death and conquer death and offer life on the other side of the grave. Suddenly that sorrow doesn't seem so big anymore compared to the joy of a Savior who came to defeat death. But we bring the sorrow of our guilt and shame this recognition that we have messed up and all of the ramifications that come with that, 
the broken relationships around us, the people we've hurt, the, the wounds we carry because of it, and we bring that guilt and shame and we hold it up to the light of Christmas. And we recognize that a Savior was born, one who would go to the cross for the sole purpose of paying the price for sin, so that those who are in Christ might be new creations. They might be made into the righteousness of God because he became sin for us, that we no longer are accountable for that, that they are washed clean in the blood of Jesus. Suddenly, the sorrow of our guilt and shame is replaced with the joy of the hope of a Savior who was born to deal specifically with that sin and shame. Or bring the sorrow of loneliness and rejection, a feeling like no one loves you and no one cares, and hold it up next to the light of Christmas. And ask yourself, if no one cares, then why did God leave the throne room of heaven? If no one cares, then why did he trade his omnipotence? Why did he trade his, his eternal nature? Why did he trade the infinite communion between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Why did he trade all of that to become a baby in a manger in the middle of nowhere? Well, they tried to start killing him from the moment he was born. And they didn't stop until they succeeded. Why trade heaven for earth unless you are never unloved? You are never alone. You are never forgotten. For God came to be with you. And suddenly the sorrow of your loneliness pales in comparison to the joy of Christmas. We sing a song here every once in a while for invitation, and we started singing it primarily because of one line that I just, I love it. I cannot get over it. It is one of the most profound truths. In the course of the song, he says simply over and over and over again, he says, earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. As we talk about the gift exchange, the joy of Christmas is bring your sorrows. Don't pretend like life isn't hard. Don't pretend like circumstances aren't difficult. Don't pretend like you're not struggling. Bring it all to the manger and know the truth. A Savior was born. He is Christ the Lord. And this is good news of great joy for all the people. And it can turn even the most difficult of days into a Dida day into a day worth rejoicing. I'll use this analogy to kind of wrap things up in a bow. I think it's, it's fitting. Some of you are going to have to remember a long time ago to when you were kids, okay? <laughs> and it's the dog days of winter, okay? If you remember being in school, there's a gap from like the second weekend in February until like the second weekend in April where there are no days off of school, right? You get the long weekend in February, and then depending on when spring break falls, somewhere between the last week in March and like the second week of April, and there's like eight straight weeks where they expected you to go to school five days in a row every single week, and it was awful. If you think I'm making this up, ask a school teacher. They know exactly what I'm describing because they have it marked on their calendar, right? Seven straight weeks, huh? This is going to be interesting. And every once in a while, early March, because you live in Ohio, you would wake up on like March 7th and it would look like this outside your window. <laughs> now, those of you who are young, you already know what happened because you got a text alert and a thing in the app and your phone call to your house at like 5 o'clock in the morning. But 30 years ago when I was a kid and longer than that for some of you, you'd get up and you'd turn on the radio or the TV and you'd watch the scroll, right? <laughs> And the schools are listed in alphabetical order. Come on. Yeah, you, like, you know, my school was East Muskingum, and every time I turned on the TV, it was starting in the F's. And so you had to watch it go all the way around. And that moment, as a 9 or 10 or 11-year-old kid, when you saw your school flash up on the screen, was the the greatest sense of joy a nine-year-old can experience, right? <laughs> I have to go to school today. I get a break. It's a snow day. Something joyous penetrated the mundane, ordinary, routine difficulty of life. And what I pray for you this Christmas, 
is that you would encounter Jesus like that. That through prayer, through worship, through our services here, through your own Bible study, through your own Advent wreaths, whatever it looks like for you, that you would encounter Jesus in such a way that the joy of that good news, that a Savior was born, He is Christ the Lord, would pierce into the monotony, routine, difficulty, mundaneness of your life and help you to understand that every moment is a Dida moment. Because every moment is a moment marked by the love of a God who sent His Son to save us from our sin. And that earth has no sorrow that is bigger than the joy of Christmas. Father, we come to this moment we thank you for Christmas. We thank you for the joy that comes from this story. We thank you for our kids and the work they put in and the, the joy and energy with which they shared that story today. We are reminded that amidst all of the hustle and bustle and the give me, give me, got it of Christmas that everyone else celebrates, this is where the joy is found. Good news of great joy for all the people. Savior is born. He is Christ the Lord. Father, I pray you would make that truth real in our hearts right now. I would pray for those who don't know that truth, who have never experienced that truth, that today would be the day that they leave a message online or they grab me after service or they talk to a friend this week and they go, listen, I want some of that joy in my life. Let today be the day that they welcome Christ into their life for the first time. And let his joy replace their sorrow. And for the rest of us, as we leave this place, may we do so full of that joy. Not the, the fake happiness that comes with Christmas. Not the sing the song and open the presents and everybody's happy until tomorrow. But the real stuff. The stuff deep in our soul that lets us face any obstacle, any hardship with the joy that comes from knowing Jesus. Father, we praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.